2020 hit us like a steam train. And 2021, um, and hence my title, which I think is um, quite apt, is time time for action. Can we move on? Can you? So I've already mentioned this. I think uh, this slide just tells us exactly where we are. I mean, if you think back to 2020, the pandemic, floods, uh, forest fires, etc., cetera, um, we've, we've turned this world upside down. Next slide. What really brought this home to me was the uh, Worldwide Fund for Nature's uh, 2020 Global Living Planet Index, which, which uh, shows us that since 1970, we've lost 68% of our species. So the biodiversity index has plummeted. And, and quite honestly, um, we need to turn that around. And possibly what has happened in this last year is, is showing that, that if we, um, you know, if we give it a chance, we can turn it around. Next slide. So if we look at South Africa, because often there's, there's talk about, well, we're not the biggest contributor, um, look at China, look at America. But if you do it on a, on a weighted basis, you can see that the world average in terms of CO2 uh, per GDP is 0.3, and we're sitting at 0.7. So that's double the world average. Um, so quite honestly, we have got a lot to do, and maybe more so than what we think. Next slide. I'm just going to run through very quickly. I think it's quite important um, from Nedbank's point of view as to why we uh, focus on sustainability. Um, and if you look at our purpose, um, is to use our financial expertise to do good for individuals, families, business, and society. Um, so I think as a purpose, purpose-driven organization, this is really important. But what really under, underpins it, and Janine, you can move to the next slide. Just maybe go through two slides, yeah, and the next one as well. Right, there we go. So I think, if, you know, most of us, sorry, one back. So most of us will have seen now uh, that, um, uh, will have seen these sustainable development goals, and SDGs is what really underpins our purpose and, and gives us focus in terms of living our purpose as well. Next slide. So what we've... Um, what we've really focused on as a bank is that if we look at those three circles, and I'll just explain them very quickly, um, CSR spend, which is the smallest one, that's um, what we do through the foundation, uh, NetBank Foundation, and that's a, that's a small amount in terms of what we can contribute. So it's $124 million. Um, you know, So there's, uh, yes, there's, there's certainly impact, and we look at projects that have catalytic impact, but um, the reality is it's 124 million, and we spread that amongst many SDGs and many projects. Um, if if you look at what we spend, uh, net bank spends in terms of 30 billion, sure we can do a lot through, um, you know, what suppliers we use and how we drive that. So very important, 30 billion. The biggest impact around about 170 to 180 billion, um, and it might be even a bit more now, is is through lending. So you know we've. We know that if we want to drive change, uh, we need to do it through our lending to have the greatest impact. Next slide, please. I'm just going to mention the role of partnerships, and I'll just put one up on the screen. WWF has been a partner for, for 30 years. In fact, it was this year was 30 years um, in terms of celebration, et cetera. But in the last eight years, they've been our partner from an agricultural point of view, and, and this is critical, from a, a, a broad-based sustainability uh, perspective. And what I like about this partnership is that, yes, it has a very clear environmental focus, but it is also practical in terms of understanding that we need to keep farmers on the land and they need to be profitable and, sus and sustainable. And I can talk to quite a few partnerships. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through them all now, but I think partnership is critical going forward. Um, and, and, and this is probably going to form the foundation of how we do things, not only for NetBank. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to mention here, and I'm not going to go through through all these points, is that 
it, you know, quite clearly, climate change is now one of the top risk factors, if not the top risk factors facing farmers. Uh, and I, I do think um, that it's not purely about sort of renewable energy. So if we go back to the topic, you know, is renewable energy a game changer? Well, maybe on its own, it's certainly not a silver bullet, but in, com in combination with other sustainability practices, it certainly is a game changer. And therefore, I think, uh, certainly from a banker's point of view, um, the way to look at it, and whether it's uh, water, energy, soil health, uh, food waste, recycling, etc., you need to look at all of those from a risk-based um, uh, view. So when you're looking at your business, what is the risk that you're facing, climate risk? And it might even be from a, a, a cost uh, perspective as well. So that's starting to, to come through. What we're seeing is that, um, you know, new technology um, such as uh, solar panels um, and, 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 and so on is, is that if you, if you go back, you know, five years, 10 years, it was very difficult to get farmers to consider uh, taking it up. But, um, but that has now changed. The, the rands and cents are stacking up. So not only from a security of supply, but also from uh, in terms of payback period. So we, we're seeing quite clearly farmers are taking it up because it makes business sense. And I think that's one of the key, uh, uh, the key moves that we've seen over the last two or three years. Next slide, please. So this I just took out of a, it, uh, it was a glossary and, and, it, and it had various um, definitions and renewable energy. And, it, and it's, it's, it's very practical. It's common sense. I mean, you can read it for yourself. But, you know, fossil fuels, we... We, we, we burn them once and they're consumed and they're gone forever. Whereas solar energy, renewable, it's from the sun, it's harvested daily, no effect on the sun energy, we can harvest it again tomorrow. So in that sense, especially from a production point of view, and I'll, I'll go to the next slide, please, Deneen. If we look at this, this slide, and it talks about life cycles. So, you know, it's, I think it's a bit unfair to say renewable energy, if you just look at that sort of production or that operational process, as it's called here. If you, if you look at that in isolation, there is no comparison against um, coal-fired electricity. Um, but if you you have to look at the, the upstream and the downstream, so the before and after, to, to really look at the full life cycle. And even then you can see uh, PV or solar, as it's called, um, is you know 40 grams CO2 uh, per kilowatt hour and coal-fired electricity 1,000. So I think if you look at the, the whole life cycle, and you take into account the setup and then the decommissioning de part of it, it, it is certainly a no-brainer from that point of view. Next slide, please. So I think, um, and I don't want you to spend too much time because I'm, I'm sure some of the other panelists are going to talk to this. Um, certainly what we feel from Nedbank's point of view is that when you're looking at a funding arrangement, we do need to... Um, to see the benefit uh, from a, a business sustainability and a financial sustainability. So we do expect our farmers to do their homework. They must understand the existing demand, the uh, mix of tariffs, um, because quite honestly, um, you know, the sun cycle doesn't always match the sort of demand cycle in terms of electricity. So it's really important that you do your homework properly. Um, if you, if you then um, do your sums correctly, and you've got to look at the risk-based approach, as I said, you've then got to put that into cash flow projections. You've got to look at the repayment ability, critical. But that's the theory. Um, this solar installation has to work. It has to match up. It has to then deliver on what it's meant to do. Because if it doesn't, it's going to put your whole business at risk. And, and I'm sure some of the other speakers will, will speak to that, because that is critical at the end of the day, we don't want to get three, four years down the line in terms of financing it to find that it's now subpar and it's not doing what it should do and it actually puts your whole business at risk. Next slide, please. So then just a couple of slides to, um, you know, just to round up is that uh, NetBank, we, we do finance sustainability. From an agricultural point of view, our focus is on uh, water, energy, soil health, uh, and food waste, recycling part of the food waste, if you want to call it that. I think, um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, really important that you um, look at it from a holistic point of view. Uh, 
we we certainly feel that the discussion with each client is is different. We have to look at you know each of their own circumstances. We we need to really understand what works for them. Um, but in so doing, I think you can um, have an approach which talks to building resilient farming businesses, and that's what we want to do um, going forward. I think just to add on to it at this point is to say that um, where we haven't got to yet is how banks use the data on the back end. So yes, we are helping clients, um, you know, look at uh, climate risk, etc. What are we doing with that data on the back end? And I think that's a work in progress as to how we look at your, our, our risk modeling and in so doing, then look to um, uh, ensure that we're providing funding which matches the risk. Because if, if we're putting something in place which actually reduces risk, we should be looking to give you that benefit in terms of pricing. But that's, that's certainly work in progress. Um, I just want to end off then by saying, from a financing point of view, we do have time periods up to up to eight years, because if you go back three or four or five years, quite difficult to see that repayment ability in a in a short period of time, or let's say, um, you know, in a normal five six year time period. We extended it to eight years to make it um, or to help it to to be cash flow neutral. But what is important now is that the payback times have come down drastically. So you know, recently I've, I've I've been to three farmers in in the uh, for the last year, um, who one is a mushroom farmer, one is a beef farmer, and one is a citrus farmer. The citrus farmer and the mushroom farmer are grid tied, um, have reduced their um, or have sort of altered their mix of energy substantially. Um, they're looking at it from a, a from two points of view. One is the risk of or security of supply, but the other is um, a cost competitive point of view. Um, and then the, the beef farmer who's gone totally off grid, obviously uh, a different demand in terms of energy, but all of them are looking at payback periods with, which are less than, than four years. It does depend again, whether you, you're going for the batteries or, or no batteries, um, because typically to add batteries to a system probably double, you know, doubles the um, cost of that installation, which, which can then make it um, significant. Okay, Deneen, just the last two or three slides, just run through the next one. Okay. Yep. And then we can go through to the last one. All right. So I think I think I just want to finish off with this. Um, Dr. Zeus is, is one of my uh, favorites. And, you know, in terms of growing up, I used to love cat in the hat and green eggs and ham, etc. And uh, so I think if you look at his quote at the bottom, Unless someone like you and us cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And that's, and that's truly where we are now, given the context that we're in, that we do have to pull together. And if we do that, I think we can make a difference. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for that, John. Um, so, yeah, quickly before we move on, um, so one of the questions that um, that I've got for you, from the bank's perspective, what is your what is your long term outlook for ESCOM, um, and is it such that you would that you would really recommend all farmers that um, that do rely on on electricity for their processes to seriously consider investing? in at least some degree of self-generation? Um, yes. Uh, and let me, um, I think, Deneen, let me talk to the mushroom farmer example. Um, so, so he has a farmer producing mushrooms, uses tons of energy during the day. Um, I think his monthly uh, bill is about 150000 It's going up at, as you said, 15%, 16% per annum. And um, and he's also starting to add new grow rooms as well. So there's a couple of issues with that. One is security of supply. Um, you know, as he as he puts on or, or uh, invests in new grow rooms, he needs to have additional electricity. Now that's not necessarily always available. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is is that um, they, in terms of the margin squeeze that is playing out. Um, electricity costs, and I think Kulani mentioned up front, is, is you know it's a massive input into 
to many businesses and you know mushroom farmer would be no different so for for them to be cost competitive and to help peg their costs so what he's done is he's um, invested in about of a third of his capacity he's about two to three hundred kilowatts um, that he's now actually invested in in terms of uh, capacity and that's probably you know a quarter of his total mix it is a first phase it's ground mounted so he had to buy some land next door because that's the other thing is not everybody has sufficient roof space for land. Um, and, and in this case, he had to buy land to, to put panels on, you know, so they estimated you need um, about a hectare for uh, sort of one megawatt plant. Um, and, and so from his point of view, pegging costs and security of supply are critical to, to his business. So just coming back to your question around ESCOM, yes, I mean, it, it's, it's just incredible to see that they've managed to shave off 90 billion um, you know, from their balance sheet. Fantastic mm. progress. And I think they need to be applauded for that. But at this point, the, you know, the debt load still remains extremely high. We've had subdued e- economic growth. So you could argue that, the, you know, demand for electricity has been subdued as well. So if we get back into a growth phase and if we start to, um, to really grow this economy, uh, it's going to be a restriction or a constraint, mm-hmm. and, I, and, and I think that that's a big fear, and that's why we also welcome uh, welcome and, and it was a major shift going from one megawatt to 100 megawatts in terms of uh, production capacity. That that is just astounding. Yeah. I mean, 100 megawatts can probably uh, help to fire up smelters, etc. You know, or, or these big sort of coal mines and so on. So you know, Richard might talk a bit more about that later. Um, and and so these are positive signals, and I think it is an appreciation that we need to have a, a better energy mix going forward. Um, it's good for the country. It's good for the environment. So, so all in all, the restrictions that sort of ESCOM are facing when they're constraints, um, I think is a realization that we have to look to alternative energy. So, you know, it's, it's not all bad. It's not all bad.